Hello, this is uh, episode 28 of the Serious About Security podcast for February 25th, 2013, brought to you by the Center for Education and Research and Information Assurance and Security, or Sirius, at Purdue University. I'm Preston Wiley, and I'm joined by Keith Watson and Mike Hill for today's podcast. We'll start with the first article, which I believe is Keith's. So the first article is related to a blog post on the Google Online Security Blog, in which they talk about how they've, um, how the various techniques they've used to protect our Gmail accounts have been pretty effective. And so, one of the techniques that spammers typically have used in the past is try to hijack accounts, and then to use the address book or the contacts in that Gmail account to send out spam messages. Some of which were very. Um, seemed rather legitimate, like uh, I was traveling in London and I've lost my wallet and I, I need help, can you wire me some money? In fact, we uh, have a friend of mine who actually had that problem, she didn't travel to London, but uh, a bunch of her contacts sent her email and said, are you okay, um, can I send that money to you? And she's like, what, what's going on? She had no idea that this actually happened, somebody actually compromised her account credentials and used her account to send out what seemed like pretty legitimate messages to a bunch of friends who were then inquiring about her <laughs> well-being and how her trip to London was. So they've made a few changes, um, some of which involves checking to see, um, like if you logged in um, a couple countries away from where you did just a few minutes ago, that's kind of a sign. There are a couple other keys which they don't talk about specifically about what um, has been going on, uh, what techniques they're using, but uh, they provide some additional tools such as the two-factor authentication system. They also have a, an account recovery system which you get reminded of periodically if you've not set it up when you're logged into Gmail. You can also see at the very bottom uh, details about your current connection and where, you're el where else you're logged in which is also helpful to see if somebody else is using your account from a, a system that uh, that you're not aware of and you can cancel that which is nice and if they suspect you aren't you know somebody logging in as you is not actually you they will uh, send you uh, to a web page to where you have to verify your your identity which may mean sending you a verification code over SMS that you have to then type in to the system and so They've uh, done this, and the result is basically a significant drop-off in the number of compromised accounts and those accounts uh, that they block for sending spam. And so they claim uh, roughly, oh, what is it, 99.7% drop-off or something like that since their peak in uh, 2011. So this is all pretty good news, and there's a follow-up article uh, posted on Threat Post as well, which uh, talks basically about what we've already discussed. So I thought this was good to see uh, Gmail taking a a, um, a proactive stance, if you will, and trying to br uh, bring down the amount of spam, but also trying to protect user accounts. And hopefully uh, some other services will adopt some of these techniques. I know that Facebook does have some of that with login approvals and login notification features. And um, we're kind of waiting on Twitter to catch up in terms of two-factor authentication. So that's what I wanted to talk about. Yeah, what, what I found alarming in the article was just the sheer number of breaking attempts that Gmail deals with. Um, it said that they've seen a single attacker use stole, stolen passwords to attempt to break into a million different Google accounts on a daily basis uh, for weeks at a time. They've also had... Um, sign-in rates of more, trying to break into more than 100 accounts per second, uh, which I think really kind of puts it in perspective that the sheer volume uh, that uh, of accounts they're trying to be hacked into for Gmail. So if they are truly achieving 99.7%, that, that is great, uh, but that's still probably a fairly large number of accounts <laughs> in, in pure numbers that still maybe are getting uh, hacked into. So um, as we said before, you know, additional things you can do such as two-factor uh, really will help increase the security. Well, I think this is a... Um a step, I suppose, in the direction of essentially forcing two-factor authentication for connections, and I, it seems to me like they're 
forcing basically two-factor authentication if they suspect that you are not who you say you are, if something is odd. And um, uh, I, I think uh, the first, the first uh, people on this or the first groups that did this were banks. I know that my bank, if I, uh, if for the last several years, if I, if they, if I wasn't on a computer that I had logged into before, they will uh, force me to verify my my account uh, essentially by sending me a code on my phone or via my email. So I think this is great that Google's doing this, and hopefully that this uh, ninety nine point seven or 99, I thought I read 99.4, but I don't think that's a 0.3% difference. Um, I hope, hopefully that has an impact and says, hey, look, we should do this as well. But, but it's, I mean, in, in a way, it's in the, in the best interest of the people involved. But in another way, it's, it, you know, it, 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 it hurts their reputation if, if places get, if they, if accounts get hijacked, increases the, the burden on them from a customer service standpoint. But um, the other question that has to be asked is how much, how much effort does it take, and is it worth it for the uh, companies to do it as well? Until there's like a standard API or something like that to do this for everybody, it's not going to be done across the board, except for the big, the big players like Facebook and Google and and uh, Twitter and, and and places like that. Uh, maybe, but you know the Google one-time password system, which is the basis of the two-step authentication service, is based on RFC standards. They use the time-based uh, one-time password protocol, and that is actually um, what their Google Authenticator app uses on your phone. And the nice thing about that is anybody who implements that RFC standard you can then use your Google Authenticator app and load that that one-time password key into your phone and even though you're using Google Authenticator you can use it to authenticate to a number of services um, also the Facebook app now includes a code generator which I believe is probably based on the on the TOTP uh, RFC as well although that's not been publicly stated um, so you know that's one kind of standard that people are using to implement these but then there's also uh, some other factors like Facebook uses uh, SMS messaging to send you a code um, and Google can do that too so it's kind of this process that these services are using that I think while are not a written standard may soon become the de facto standard and other online services may implement that because if you have one customer who's already using one time password systems on one service and you implement something very close to that well you're gonna have to do less training less uh, you know user support to help those users uh, use your system as well so that may be a benefit if everybody kinda goes the same way yeah, and I think it'll be, I mean, I think this is a great step Google has taken, uh, but I do agree with, with Preston that, you know, Google and Facebook as single sign-on providers, uh, they have more pressure on them because people can use those accounts in multiple places. I mean, you can go to almost any, a, a lot of new websites, it's like sign in with Facebook, sign in with Google. Uh, so for them, they really need to make sure they're protecting those accounts as best they can because a compromise of your Google account could actually give someone access to a dozen or more different sites under that ID. Um, so I hope, I mean, I'm, I'm really glad to see them taking these steps and I do hope that others will be able to follow um, but th this is a great step and, and I'm looking forward to to more things they'll come out with okay well I'll move on to the next article which has to do with uh, social engineering uh, to get into the Super Bowl uh, there was a video posted uh, from what I can tell it's been taken down permanently due to copyright violations uh, supposed alleged copyright violations um, but these two uh, people from I can't remember what university they're from I don't have the article Savannah up. State I believe Savannah State um, basically social engineered their way into the Super Bowl this year that was in New Orleans and um, the video was pretty 
was pretty interesting because they they came in and they didn't have tickets to get into the Super Bowl and they were able to essentially go through security layer after security layer after security layer just um, making it look appearing as if they were supposed to be there and um, at the end of the video we see that they are they get into the Super Bowl around the time when the halftime show starts um, and uh, the, the methods they used were very simple just acting like they they were uh, they were supposed to be there and uh, one method that what well, I thought was particularly in particularly interesting is they had a they had a box that they were both carrying and there was a security guard on a door and um, the security guard actually opened the door and let them in without checking their identification or anything like that because they were carrying a box so he wanted to be helpful and that's I think one one uh, uh, thing about social engineering is people want to help want to be helpful to, to each other and uh, that's and, and I think it was very interesting to watch the video I don't know if you got to see it Keith but I know no, Mike, sadly I they took it down before I was able to see it Mike I know Mike saw it and uh, and uh, it's it's I wish it was still up but um, unfortunately I think the uh, this was a little bit of an embarrassment for the uh, NFL and they, and they found a way to get it taken down through the uh, DMCA type copyright violation stuff. So, um, but still, the 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 concept of social engineering and uh, acting like you belong and and people attempting to help you and all that is is relevant. And I did post an, a link to another article on a, a group Zug.com who. Basically, they, they live on doing pranks, I, I, I guess. Um, essentially, uh, w was able to sneak some contraband into the, uh, the Super Bowl six years ago um, and spell a message out in the, in the, in the, in the stands um, during the halftime show. And um, they have a very detailed article on what they did, how they did it, and uh, even tips on, on social engineering. So um, I thought that was an interesting item for discussion. Yeah, we talk about uh, social engineering all the time, and a lot of that and what we deal with is more about, you know, email messages that people are sent that seem legitimate and, you know, have an attachment that they open and it contains malware, and then suddenly their system is now compromised. And the other way is, you know, if, you know physical security access. They, like you said, they, they appear to be there. They wear a nice suit. They put on a janitor uniform or something like that with their name on it and what looks like a legitimate ID badge, and somebody lets them in. I mean, that happens. So we have to make sure that um, when it comes to electronic communications, that we can verify the senders, um, you know, watch out for things that are not legitimate, and as a fallback, have mechanism to protect uh, systems and accounts from malware, obviously. But also, when it comes to physical security, there needs to be a way to verify identification. You know, we need to avoid these situations where everybody wants to be helpful. It's the helpful ones that, that can compromise security the most. Yeah, I wish you would have uh, gotten the opportunity to see the video, Keith. It was it was pretty amazing. Uh, it was a very well thought out plan, I believe. Um, it, these couple college students, they you know they knew what they were doing. I think they started you know they embarked shortly after kickoff, I believe, and they they started pretty far away, and they just sort of worked their way uh, all the way up, you know, and they they pretty much overcame every obstacle that was presented to them. I mean, there was at least three times I remember from watching in the video where they, they encountered something where had they gotten flustered or nervous they probably would have been stopped there uh, but they just sort of you know like you know you said they, they acted like they belonged and just sort of convinced the other people just to let them through um, and I know one of the the most interesting moments uh, Preston even commented to me on this was that there's a point where they come up on a gate and, and the a security guard just yelling you know no one gets through here without identification and they just sort of go off to the side and there's another guard, and they say, "Hey, can we just cut cut through right here?" And, and you know, the guy just opens opens the fence up for them, and and boom, they're they're right through. 
And um, it, it's just like, wow, you know, uh, you know, all they did was just ask nicely, hey, hey, can we cut through here? Oh, sure, no problem. You know, everyone's sort of relaxed. The game has started, and you know, they're not being, they're not really on their toes as much. And uh, there's even a part where um, I, I believe they run into a police officer. It says, oh, oh, you guys are heading the wrong way. You know, you need to, you need to come up this way to, to, to get through. And they're like, oh, okay. You know, they start walking with the officer, and then the officer gets distracted, and they just turn around and they start walking back the other way, and they sort of lose them in a crowd. Uh, so it, it really was, um, it was really a very interesting video. I mean, in some ways, I wish they would have let it stay up just so security engineers could could study it and understand it. Uh, but really, it, you know, that's exactly what they did. They just looked for, you know, they just acted like they belonged, and uh, they didn't get flustered and. You know, so every step along the way, they just, you know, it's like, oh, well, I don't have that with me. Can, can you help me out here? You know, I, I just want to, you know, I'm just trying to get to this next part. And uh, they pretty much, once they kind of got on the grounds, I think everyone just assumed they belonged there, you know. And, you know, then it, I think it actually got easier once they were within, the, you know, once they really got close to the stadium because they were in locations where, it's, where it was, well, no one's going to be here unless they belong. So they just sort of strolled right in, and I think they got there just about halftime. Right, and it's kind of that, that uh, strong perimeter but squishy middle approach, the uh, m m approach to security, right? Well, I think uh, one thing that, uh, I mean, it's hard to say from the the most recent one, but from the Zug.com article, um, it seems to me that it's fairly obvious that the uh, the security staff they had a lot of security staff. I mean, they had a lot, and they and all the the security staff were of different levels. There were federal agents, there were state. Uh, police officers. There were basically people who had a security jacket on, and that was basically their their the extent of their security training. And uh, I think there was a there everybody, especially the the federal agents and the state police officers. They have their own uh, methods in which they do security, and I, and and I wouldn't be surprised if there was a complete and utter lack of communication between the different levels of security. That, people that they had there and I think uh, that is is what uh, contributes to uh, to some of the security issues is that these people do not communicate with each other at all and they have different different things that they think are important within security and uh, and the people who just put on the security jackets I'm guessing their training is pretty minimal and it's just like don't let somebody through that door unless you think they're supposed to be unless they're supposed to be here and you know it's up to their judgment on are they supposed to be here or not and and I think that uh, leads to a lot a lot of these problems is is a lack of training and a lack of communication and it's pretty easy to get a security jacket. Um, when I lived in Colorado, I went to a surplus store, and they actually had a whole rack full of jackets, uh, you know, the standard uh, windbreakers with uh, security uh, silk screened on the back. So I bought one, of course. Why wouldn't you? Uh, so I have my own. So whenever I need to go somewhere and I fit, it, fit in, I, I've got my jacket for that. So if you guys want to borrow it, let me know. <laughs> Well, another thing that was pointed out in, in, in the Zug.com article was that um, basically they had to uh, to get a – they had two pallets of, of, of stuff that they basically snuck in. Um, I say snuck in, but they did have to go through the security. Um, and, and one of the things they needed to, uh, to deliver it was a parking pass. And uh, they had to go through security to get this parking pass, including, I guess, go through a background check. Um, an inst basically an instant bath background check from the Homeland Security uh, Department. But they, the, the thing that is inter interesting is they said once you get a s single credential within the, uh, in, in the system, all the other sets that you need are very, very easy to get after you get your first. Right. That makes sense. I mean, they, they want to be secure, but but they still have that single perimeter approach, and you you don't need uh, higher privilege to get further in. And, you know that's probably a, a failing on on the security side of that. But uh, you know it's hard to it's hard to know what actually goes on because most of the time these organizations don't share a lot about how their physical security practices and what what the layers are in in the inside are. 
So it's not something they discuss because obviously they don't want people trying to bypass it and find weaknesses. Yeah, well, I know with this latest incident, they did report that the the NFL is looking into it. Um, I don't know that we'll hear any more about it uh, because I don't I don't think they're going to say, yeah, we really messed up and we're going to change things. They'll, they'll probably just change things quietly and uh, hope to keep it quiet and, and not really draw too much attention to it. Um, but, you know, it's... Um, I think it's just really a difficult thing, especially on something the size of a Super Bowl. These things probably happen more often than are reported um, because, as you said, there, there's so many people, there, there's so many communications that have to take place. And um, once, like you said, once you have some set of credentials, once, you, once you're once you thought to belong there, it becomes a lot easier to uh, to move about. I mean, I think about it as like getting into an office. A lot of times it's getting past the front desk. You know, but once you're past the front desk, how many people actually say, oh, are you supposed to be up on this floor? Or, you know, they, they just sort of assume, oh, well, they, they belong here because they got through security downstairs. So, so you know, they're authorized to be here. So I, I think it's just a, a, a good reminder of, you know, how easy it is for people to actually kind of get past some of those barriers. And, and sometimes it doesn't hurt to just double check and ask. <laughs> Well, I'll give one more example that I found interesting, and uh, th this was, uh, they were attempting to, basically they had to move their their stuff, this was again the Zug.com because they provided a significant amount of details on what they did. They had to move their stuff to a storage area in order, and because they did this the day before the Super Bowl instead of the day of when they dropped their stuff off. And uh, there was a security guard in the area. and. Uh, the person, the person who was delivering it, said, "Hey, uh, can you, uh, can you, um, uh, well, uh, I'm going to leave this here, and I need to use the restroom. Can you watch my uh, my camera and and my 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 video equipment?" And the security guard agreed. And uh, apparently, another security guard came by and, and was like, uh, "Hey, what's going on? Who who are these people?" It's like, "Okay, it's okay. I vouch for them." Um, so it, it was just an example of if, if some once somebody helps you out, they want to trust you. They they you right. know they don't want to be helping somebody out who's a bad person. You know who's not supposed to be there. So once you once somebody helps you out, then they're going to essentially vouch for you uh, to other people who may question if you're supposed to be there. Right. Yeah, that's a good example of of uh, human weaknesses that can be exploited. Okay, well, I guess that we'll we'll wrap it we'll wrap up the podcast today. Uh, thanks, Keith Watson and Mike Hill. I'm Preston Wiley. Have a safe and secure day.